Hello and welcome back to part two of HVAC and Building Automation Systems Fundamentals. My name is Phil Zito and we're going to be moving through the second part of chapter one in the Honeywell Gray Manual. This course will continue to last about 32 weeks, covering all 16 chapters and questions will follow the presentation. We are going to be moving through quite a bit today. I'm going to stay at about the 30,000 foot view level and highly encourage you to go into the video chat and ask specific questions because there's just so much in this video that if I'm going to keep it at 30 minutes, I've got to stay pretty high level. But with that being said, um, share it with your friends and encourage you to post your questions so that I can get more specific. We're going to start with control variables. We're then going to move through control loops, methods, and modes. We're going to hover around PI, PID a little bit. And we're also going to capture around uh, floating step and to position. Uh, if you understand control modes and you understand control loops, then you will be halfway done with the battle. Because really understanding the flow of a control loop as well as the work of a control mode will help you understand how to properly program a control system. So with that being said, let's jump in. A thermostat. All right, you don't see these every day. Okay, well maybe you do. But what we're looking at here is a simple control loop. We're looking at some control variables, what is called a process variable, a control variable, a controller, a set point, maybe a secondary input, maybe we're looking at outdoor air temp, we've got our cooling coil right here, we've got our entering temperature and our leaving temperature. This is a discharge air temperature sensor. We've got some airflow coming in and our discharge air, let's say it's at uh, 50 Let's say it's at 70 degrees, and our set point is 50. Now our controller is going to say, hey, I've got a 20 degree drift. What's going on here? I need to give an output to my cooling valve, and I need to say, hey, 42 degree water, you need to come in, take some BTUs out. Now you're leaving at 55. My 70 degree air is now... Let's say it's uh, 55, and hey, my discharge air is getting closer to satisfied, but it's not quite there yet. So hey, Mr. Controller, you're not giving me enough. I need you to go from 50% to 75%. It gives some more valve, temperature drops a little more, now I'm at 50, and lo and behold, temperature is satisfied, communicates back to the controller, hey, back off, but hey, wait. I've been providing chilled water and I've cooled down too much. I'm now at 47 degrees. So it's saying, hey, you're overshooting. And that, my friends, is called lag. That right there is when your variable starts to change faster than your feedback. So we're dropping the temperature too quick. Controller can't keep up or sensor's too far, one of the two. And because of that, we have to add in some tuning. We'll talk about that with PI, proportional integral control, and we'll talk about how we use that to tune a loop, quote unquote. And uh, just a toss out to one of uh, fellow bloggers out there, Abel Ramirez has a blog on loop tuning that I will put in the comments and uh, you can look at his specific blog because I'm not going to get into tuning loops. I'm just going to talk about loops in general. So with that being said, let's continue to move on. All right. You know what? I love stories. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell a story before I left the slide. You've at least got to get one of my stories. Okay, so I was doing a church um, several years back. And <laughs> they decided that they wanted to put the dis differential pressure sensor in the church and the central plant a half a mile away from the church and the secondary chilled water valves were controlling off that differential pressure sensor so it had to go through some switches so here's the main church here's the plant this is half a mile okay 
they're running four to twenty signal because that's about all they could do and they actually first they tried to do this they tried to run the signal all the way which uh, four to twenty is good for long runs but half a mile is really stretching it so then they said okay we're gonna put a controller here controller here we're gonna use a fiber backbone IP fiber and we're gonna take the input pass it via fiber and give it to the controller here but they had packet lag so it came in here went through VLAN filtering and came through and had packet lag so they had quite a bit of lag meaning that I was controlling to 20 psi here and this little secondary chilled water VFD over here would say hey I'm seeing 20 psi is my signal and you've only got 14 so I'm gonna ramp up however it would go and it would shoot to you know 30 psi and Mr. Happy Pump over here was still going up I was like more cowbell if you've ever seen that uh Will Ferrell skit where he's uh, <laughs> it was more water and it kept going faster and faster and the reality was is that it was way too high and so we had to compensate we had to actually manually tune the loops for the different seasons because the way it reacted I mean to the heat and the concrete because I'm here in Texas there were so many goofy variables in this whole design that uh, it was just interesting now there were multiple different ways they could have compensated for this they could have put uh, multiple pressure sensors in average they could have done a, a variety of things but the key point is there was lag between the process variable and the actual control variable so great that it was causing them to overshoot and actually provide too much chilled water which then was causing chilled water valves to get out of tune at the air handlers so you've got this air handler, it's got a chilled water valve, and this valve's all nice and happy. It's like, hey, I'm a valve, I'm getting chilled water. Oh, I'm getting a ton of chilled water, so I could close myself down. And it would close itself down, and then <laughs> the PSI would drop all the way down to like 10 PSI, and it'd be like, oh crap, I can't get enough water, and it open all the way up. And I mean, these are like 50 ton units. So we're talking about a lot of airflow and a lot of GPMs. So what's happening here is now this unit starving and this just cyclical, it was, oh my gosh, it was a nightmare for days. I was getting called out there day after day after day. Your controls aren't working, da 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 da. And it was just driving me bonkers. And uh, needless to say, um, some engineers' designs are better than others. All right, you've got my story. I think we're good to go. Okay, control loops. So right here is an analog signal. Now, analog signals are typically pneumatic, typically resistive, things like that. Digital signals are typically just, as they say, digital. For example, you know, 0 to 10, you know, 24 volts, AC, etc., 0 to 15 PSI, you know, those kind of things. There's not much more I'm going to go into. Just realize that there's analog and there's digital. Two position. On, off. Open, close. All right? Either the door's open or it's closed. Either the valve's open or it's closed. Either the electric duct heater's on or it's off. You know, typical. Here's your garage. You've got a little space heater up here. It's got a T-stat down here in the wall feeding up. You've got a fan. And you've got an electrical coil, right? And what's happening is the air is coming through. If the temperature drops below, you've got a circuit right here. You've got a coil right here. You've got maybe 120 passing through this coil. Okay. This close. Or what's going to happen? This contact's going to close. Coil's going to energize. All right. Now your electric, your resistive heat's going to turn on. 
your fan's going to turn on, etc. And then, granted, when it cool or when it warms up too much, that circuit's going to open. This is going to disengage, and that, in a sense, is two position. Now, kind of same thing for the valve. You know, you've got a two position valve right here. You've got like a radiator against a window, and if it goes above that temperature, that valve's going to open up, let some water through, warm it up, and then as soon as it goes down. Now, typically you'll see two position in low lag situations, meaning this is like one foot away from the valve, if that. And there's typically no controller. Um, it's typically a straight wire to the valve. Usually, like, a resistive element is right here in the actual actuator. Two position you'll see quite often in garages, radiators, things like that. Uh, DX cooling is another example of two position. It's either on or off, but that is more in the step control. Floating and step. Okay. So if you were to look at a controls diagram, 75, 70, 65... If you were to look at a temperature layout and you looked at on-off control, it would look something like this. Crazy, right? Not very good. Well, and here in this thing. It's not supposed to be very good. You're not going and giving your CEO on-off control for his AC box. At least you shouldn't, or you should be fired. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe not fired. But you should uh, probably consider your heating and cooling strategy. Whereas floating is, it's gonna fl it's gonna go and it's gonna have three stages: open, on, hold, close, off. Okay. So it's gonna say, "Hey, I'm below set point. I'm gonna turn it on a little." Oh. Nope, still below set point. Oh, nope, still below set point. Oh, above set point. I'm going to start ramping down. And it's going to look, you know, a little more smooth. It's going to, instead of being completely all over the chart, we're starting to move to the better control, you know. Instead of being way down here, it's kind of right here. So we're looking a little better. Now where step comes in is step allows you to go Step allows you to go and essentially take that on-off control that we talked about and sequence it. I don't like the term step. Forget the term step. You never saw it. Can I cover it up enough? There we go. Think of sequence. Sequencer. Because if you do anything in the field, you're going to hear of SCR a lot. Sequence control relay. This is on electric heat. You're going to hear of DX staging, so you've got uh, maybe you know a little solenoid right here, and this solenoid is getting turned on to turn this DX compressor on, okay, to allow refrigerant through to the DX. So how does this work? Well, my controller says my set point is supposed to be 72, but I'm actually at 80, so it goes in to my controller. My controller says, hey, there's an 8 degree span, and I know that for every 2 degrees I need 25%, so you must be at 100% output. I'm at 4 stages, so I'm going to turn all 4 stages on for 10 minutes, and then be off for 10 minutes. Okay? Now, maybe it drops down, everyone's happy, and this temperature drops down to, let's say, 74 degrees. So it's got a 2 degree delta, and as we said before, 2 for 25, so we're going to go here, and now we're going to say, all right, so I only need to turn stage 1 on, because each stage is worth 25%, so I'm going to then go and say, I'm going to turn stage 1 on, Maybe I turn stage 1 on for 5 minutes, turn it off for 15. And that, in a, in a sense, sequenced control. 
you're sequencing it on. So ideally what it would look like is this. It would look like a much tighter version of this. Now typically you'll see sequenced control. Um, you'll see this like You'll see it in data closets where you're sequencing DX on for like mini mates, Liebert splits, etc. You'll see it um, in residential, low end commercial, stuff like that. But the big boys, the proportional control, you know, your actual 0 to 10 output, stuff like that, um, you typically will see in the higher end commercial, um, higher end vertical markets. And that then takes us to the mother of all things, which is P and I and sometimes D. So P is your proportional. P is going to be the distance between your actual values. So let's say my set point 72 and I'm at 68. Then my P is 4 and I'm going very high level here. There's a much more around throttling range, around P gain, around all these different things that if you want to know, you can read. The Honeywell Manual does a decent job of it, but, um, and, and Abel does a pretty good job going through his tuning. Um, sadly enough, Wikipedia probably has one of the best actual technical diagnoses of P, I, and D, because um, it just gets really deep into the mathematics. But basically, the equation which we'll get into later, takes P, and it's going to take your I, and based off of this, it's going to give a value output. So P, the distance, and I, the amount of time. But we're not going to get into I just yet. So let me erase I. Let me erase... Okay, I can't get that, but... So we've got here, we've got our distance, so our proportional band is going to say 4, and that's going to equate to a value that comes out. So our proportional distance, our distance between set point and our distance from set point to actual value is going to result in some sort of output. Let's say in this case it results to 25% or maybe 2.5 volts DC. Now what does all this mean? I'm going to clear this off here for a second. So what's going to happen is we've got our set point 72 and 68. Our throttling range, the actual value that our temperature can cover as well as our valve can control to, is going to create our P-band and our P-gain. All those numbers, P-band plus P-gain plus stop, which is your startup value. So when you start, there's going to be a stop. It's typically 50% already in the loop, meaning that the loop by itself is going to start wanting to put out 5 volts DC by default, 50%. But then your proportional distance, and the amount you're either over or under, is going to add or subtract from that value. So let's say that my P is 4 but each P has a value of 10. So essentially I'm 40. And I do not ask you to follow the numbers, just understand the concepts, okay? So I take away 40, that gives me a value of 10 volt, or 10%, or one volt DC output. So what's happening here is my proportional distance, my distance from actual set point and process variable is going to add or subtract to my startup value and give me my output. And then it's going to recalculate. It's going to rinse and repeat every time. However, it's not going to take stop anymore. Stop is just for the first start. So now I've got, you know, 10. I've got a value of 10. But let's say my, uh, my value goes down. It continues to add this PV. That's going to continue to reset, and my value is going to maybe go to 5, so 0.5 volts DC. All right, confused? I know I am. I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> so let's add an I. 
I don't think we're going to go into derivative today. It is already 20 minutes in, and I'm kind of tired. So I. Okay, we've got P. P is our distance. I is time. So you hear I max and I lim. I'm just going to really kind of go over this. So if your P is your P value, your proportional distance, 72 minus 68, that's 4. And it stays 4. But it's been 4 for 60 seconds. Then it may shift that value. It's going to shift this control loop. So if you're looking at a control loop, and it's going to say 0 to 10 equals 0 to 100. All right? So this is your loop. This is at 0 seconds. So at 60 seconds, it shifts it. And it says, my 0 is now 25%. And let's say it goes to 120 seconds. It's now going to say my 0 is 50%. So essentially, the I, the amount of time you're away from P, away from your set point, it's going to shift your control value. It's going to shift how that loop controls, either to the right or to the left, depending on how you have it set up. So that is how it adapts. What's going to happen is these two values, oops, these two values are going to come in here, and P plus I, distance between set point and actual value, and then I, amount of time away from value, are going to add up. So let's talk real world for a situation. Okay. I've got an air handler. It's got a fan, and it's got a cooling valve. I'm in Texas. If you haven't figured out, I like cooling. All right. So what's going to happen is my set point is 55, but my discharge error is 60. Now let's say that my valve... You know, Joe the mechanic went and uh, he took my little ISO valve and he shut it. So I am not getting any chilled water. My chilled water valve is completely isolated. Nothing's coming through. So my loop's starting to say, okay, I need to send a signal from my controller to my loop. And I'm sending a 0 to 10 volt signal because it's a proportional digital signal, volts DC. It's coming out. And my step value is 50. My distance is 5. So let's say that my prop band has a value of 1. So right off the bat, my prop band, my I is 0. So I is 0. Here's I. Here's P. And here's stop. And this is going to be my value. So right off the bat, I'm at 55%. I go on for 60 seconds, because that's what I have it set for, and my I is set to increase by 5. So my prop is 5, my I increases by 5, my step stays 50, and now I've got 60. Several minutes go by, and my I has now reached its max of, let's say, 40. Because you never want your eye to get to the point where it can actually create something higher than your P to the point where you're at like 120%. That's called spin up or wind up, and you don't want to have that. So you always got to be careful about where you set your eye. So my value is still 5, 40, 50. So now I'm at 95%. So I've got a 95% output. So this is maybe 5 minutes in. That's a minute in. And that's at startup. So we're seeing at startup, proportional takes immediate effect. Stop is right there. That's our startup value. And our I is right there at zero, giving me a 55% output. I see 5 plus 5. My I is starting to take effect because I've been away from my variable for a certain amount of time. So I'm getting 60%. And then we see my I has hit its I max, as we like to call it, I max. And it's right there. 
Now, derivative, um, I don't use derivative. We don't typically use derivative in DDC controls. It's used for process controls. We're talking nanoseconds. Derivative tries to predict where you're going to be. It tries to produce, predict the drift. Um, you're best, honestly, leaving it off because derivative will cause overshoot typically and if you've got a self-tuning loop it tends to create wind up but if you want to know more about derivative uh, you can definitely ask me questions and I can respond to you in the questions chat but since it's specific to very few people and mainly process control we're not really going to get into it okay so we got some questions here if my sensor is one foot from my control valve, what kind of control should I use? So it's asking you what kind of, out of all the ones we've talked through, proportional, floating, on, off, what should you use? Here we're saying if I am five degrees off set point and I have been for 10 minutes, what is my output? Now I'll give you a hint. This is a PI question. So look back at the video if you have to and remember that we had a stop, we had I, we have an I max, so your I is not to exceed, and then we have a P, where for each degree you get one value of P in this case. So do the math and come up with your question. Doing, or your answer, this one question right here should really help you understand P, ID loops. It should really help you grasp what's going on. Alright, so we've went through a lot of stuff. We've covered, um, let's go back. We've covered control variables, we've covered control loops, control methods, we've controlled modes also, and went at a very high level into PI. Next week, uh, we're going to look at process characteristics, we're going to look at specifics around load, lag, and capacity, and then we're going to move into actual control system components. So appreciate your time. Feel free to share this. Uh, really pass the news around. The idea behind this is to try to educate the community and uh, really encourage you to share this with all your coworkers. Get feedback. Give me feedback on how I can make these videos better, how I can make them more impactful and more informational. You know, If this is too high level, let me know. If it's too deep, let me know. Uh, give me the information so that I can help you understand HVAC and ultimately provide uh, the best value you can to your customers. Well, thank you very much and have a good night.